Food is a cornerstone of our families, our communities, and our country. And it's something that's on all of our minds right now. But with all of the uncertainty in the world, Canadian food is one thing we can be certain about. Thanks to you, all of you, from those who produce, to those who process, to those who get it on our plate. Canadians never shy away from a challenge. We always answer the call. Every Canadian has a role to play, and ours remains unchanged, providing safe, healthy food to Canada and the world. Food has always mattered to Canadians, but never has it mattered more. And even in times where the distance feels greater, food still brings us together. Thank you for your service. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. So glad that you've taken a couple of minutes to join us for this 2022 version of the Farmland Values Report from Farm Credit Canada. My name is Kevin Stewart from Ag Vision Media. I have, uh, well, spent my career on the farm as well as being in the national news media. Uh, these days, mostly, I spend my time speaking at conferences, mostly about the impact of consuming too much negative information and how that impacts our mental health. I was fortunate to farm in Southwestern Ontario with my dad and my two older, well, I call them my evil brothers, but they're not all evil. Uh, but we farmed right here in Southwestern Ontario, which is where I am right now. And these actually are the traditional lands of four unique groups of people, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandaran peoples whom, uh, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this great land of ours. Let's bring JP in here. And uh, JP, it's been a nice to see you again, by the way. I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got here today. Um, just a question about this report for people who maybe aren't quite as familiar uh, with it. Uh, how would you describe the value of this information or maybe Maybe to put it a different way, how have farmers described why and how this, uh, this information is important to them? Well, I, I like to say good management starts with good information. And so this, you know, compiling the information that we have, that we collect in the normal, as we carry out our business and lending and so forth, uh, yeah. to me, it, it, it makes tons of sense to be able to compile it or to compile it and actually release it so that you know, producers, customers, industry have more information when it comes to making those big life decisions in terms of yeah. within their operations, whatever, whatever the strategic goals of the operations are. Um, I think more information actually helps guide some good decisions on the farm. And so it's just a small part of terms of what we do, but I think it's actually a big part as well in terms of the role it plays and mm. in terms of putting together what the outlook is for the industry, because farmlands is such a significant asset when we yeah. think of farming. So I think that's, that's what it, it means for us in terms yep. of putting this report together. And just a reminder to the folks, again, drop your questions uh, for JP into the Q&A box as you're going along, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Okay, JP, the virtual floor is all yours. Well, thanks for the introduction, and, and just want to echo what you said at the very beginning in terms of thanking everybody that is tuning in to watch this recording or this webinar. And if you're tuning in afterwards and watching a recording of the webinar, well, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, I'm going to get started. The, the initial slide basically says, hey, it's the 2021 Farmland Value Report. We're in 2022. We label the year of the data in the report. So we're looking at 2021 data. But as you'll uh, see in a second, what I want to do is to provide a brief overview of the report itself. But there are so much, there's so much information in the report. And I encourage all of you to actually go to our website at fcc.ca you'll be able to find easily the report. You'll be able to go to a section that offers even more data in terms of bringing an interactive map as well, where you can click and then dive in into just more disaggregated data with regards to farmland, getting some data on dollar per acre prices, the, the median or average versus the lower price, the higher price and so forth. There's just so much information that it, it might, you know, I don't think it's, actually would be useful for me to try to cover it all. So what I want to do is first provide a brief overview of the results and the report. And then second, I'll get uh, 
I'll take out my shiniest crystal ball and look at a little bit of what has been going on in 2021. That's the easy part, but also provide a bit of an outlook towards 2022. There are, but there is so much going on in the marketplace right now. And I know a lot of things are on the mind of different pharma operations in terms of what they can expect from the marketplace. So we'll look at that, look at some of the drivers uh, for farmland values in 2021, but also keep an eye on the future as well. Um, what you'll see up on the screen is a map of the different uh, average increases in farmland values across the country. Um, what I, I want to point out that the national average that you see up on the screen at 8.3% is function of the different weights that each province has in this national number. So for example, Saskatchewan would account for about 45% of the 8.3% average increase that we're reporting at a national level. So this is a weighted average, weighted by the share of cultivated acres in each of the province. So Saskatchewan would have a weight of about 45% in the average, Alberta would have in a, you know, roughly 30% weight in the average and so forth, right? So those two provinces, and so it's not a coincidence, in other words, that the annual average for Saskatchewan year after year after year is really close to the national average. By, that's by construction. But the report allows you to get a sense of the provincial average increase as well as areas or regions within each of the province. The one thing I believe is that is part of the storyline for a lot of different provinces in 2021 is that we're witnessing a bit of a appreciation in the rate of increase in farmland values. So farmland values have been increasing for a long time. We have to go back way back to actually start seeing a decline in the average values of farmland. But um, the rate of increase, so the rate of increase has always been positive, but now in the last few years, we've seen a little bit of an increase. Last year, uh, national increase in farmland values were five, was 5.4%. 5 and that's a little bit different than I would say the three years prior, let's just say starting around 2017, 18 and 19, where we had a slower rate of appreciation in farmland values. So our land values were still going up, but at a slower pace. And now we have a little bit of an acceleration on appreciation of the rate of increase, which I think is part of this story in 2021. And we'll, we'll dive into the reasons why and so forth. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at a picture like this, coast to coast, there are two things that, well, actually, I would say three things that matter. On the demand side, I think the strength of demand is a function of farm income or crop receipts, to be more specific, as well as low interest rates. So that's on the demand side of the equation. On the supply side, there's still very tight, um, very limited availability of farmland for sale. And it's a pure, typical supply and demand story in my head is tight supply combined with robust demand makes prices go up. And, and I think that's what we have in front of us now, of course. So that's the main storyline for, like I said, coast to coast, but there are tons of differences as well across uh, the country. And, and I'm not going to go over all the details. As, as, as I said at the very beginning, you can go to the report and find a useful, relevant information for your area. But if you start off on the eastern side of the country and look at Atlantic provinces, I think PEI and Nova Scotia offer two good examples of why, when you look at a specific region, it's a good thing, it's a good practice to actually look at a little bit more than just one year of data. Looking at a couple years of data actually helps understand the trend underlying in the marketplace. So PEI, for example, reported, that, or we reported an average increase of over 15% in, in 2021 for a PEI farmland on average. But if you go back to 2020, the average rate of increase in PEI was between two and 3%. So if you put those two years together and, and sort of average it out you know, on an annual basis, you still get a fairly significant rate of increase in farmland values of around 10%, but it, it, it brings a little bit more context when we have fewer transactions in smaller provinces, for example, and the same would apply in a very specific region of a province. To get a sense of you know, the trend, you have to go and, and look beyond just the one year of data. You know, Nova Scotia is pretty much the same thing. New Brunswick, a little bit different. You have to go back two years, actually, to find a rate of increase of around 17%. But again, putting that year of 17% increase with the, the, mo the two most recent years actually 
still, you know, uh, basically um, comes up with, you know, an average increase on an annual basis of seven, eight, nine percent. So still very strong increases. It's a diverse, there's a diversity of buyers in these provinces. We have as well noted that this year we have a bit of an influx of buyers from other provinces that are looking at land in Atlantic Canada. But it's really the diversity of the operations. If uh, beyond, you know, if you look at Prince Edward Island, for example, and, and beyond the potato sector, that accounts for about 45% of all receipts in the ag sector. Uh, beyond that, of course, potato operations are looking to grow and there are some operations that are buying land. But beyond that, there's also a really large, very diverse set of buyers as well that are looking to buy land. Focusing now on, on central Canada, well, you know, Ontario is where we recorded the largest increase of 22%. And Ontario is also a very interesting um, example in 2021 or a very, case to, a very interesting case to look at because of a number of different things. In the past, I remember that, you know, in the last couple of years, we've said that, well, some of the largest increases in Ontario would actually apply to lower priced land. So you might find yourself with a large percentage increase, but I would be off some lower valued land. In this case, you know, when we look at the 22% and we dive into the numbers and look at, you know, different regions and within the regions, different, you know, quality of land and so forth. Well, I think it's pretty fair to say that the 20 some percent increase that we've reported in a number of different regions of the province in Ontario actually apply across the board. So it, it is really interesting that the, it's, it's a pretty fairly homogeneous story when you look at the 22% increase in Ontario. So it's not just the lower price line that applies to all the different regions as well as some of the, that, that um, offer some of the highest price land in the country. So it is really, I think, an interesting example, especially as well, given that I did say at the very beginning that crop receipts were higher in 2021, but Ontario is a little bit different. Crop receipts in Ontario were roughly flat in 2021. So there are a number of different factors in play here. I do think that the limited supply of available land is one thing. I do think as well that we have some buyers that perhaps are, are I would say, migrating or there's a bit of an exodus of buyers from urban areas towards rural areas. And perhaps that trend has been always present, but maybe has been amplified to some extent by the pandemic. And so, again, a number of different factors behind the increase. Uh, and again, Quebec would be, uh, I think, a pretty good example of what I was telling you about when I said that the rate of increase in land values is actually appreciating, that we're seeing land values go up, but at a faster rate. I think Quebec is a pretty good example of that in the last three years. Now, moving to the western part of the country, looking at the prairies as well as British Columbia, I do think that the number one story there is weather. We've had extreme weather in the case of all four provinces, really. Uh, when you look at BC, the flooding was a major, major weather event. Uh, some uh, extreme drought, significant drought as well in the prairies, some that um, to the extent that we've not seen in, in a lot in decades, really. And so that was, I think, the number one storyline. But higher prices in a lot of cases, especially if you look at the Canadian prairies, did offset some of the lower yields and, and declines in production to the extent of 40%, you know, for the 2021 crop or certain some 2021 crops as well. So higher prices offset some of the lower yields. And so when you look at overall income, it's been pointing upward. It's been trending upward for a lot of different crops, even those that have been most affected by the drought and seen some of the declines in yields. Um, higher prices did offset some of those lower yields. And so with um, deliveries as well that were uh, very, very strong at uh, following harvest, uh, stronger than usual, anyhow, uh, stronger than the last few years or the average of the last few years. All of that contributed to very strong 2021 crop receipts. Now, because of those strong deliveries in tw at the end of 2021, and because you know deliveries in early 22 will be of the 2021 crop, and because there is so much that we don't know just yet about the 2022 crop, it puts a lot puts up a lot of question marks around what the outlook is going to look it looks like for crop receipts, receipts for grains and oil seeds in particular, uh, when it comes to 2022. But I'll be talking specifically about that in just a couple of minutes. And finally, in BC, uh, again, it's, it's such a diverse 
a province when it comes to the mix of different farming activities that it's really hard to point one particular sector or one particular type of buyers. And do you think that some of the urban pressures that I was talking about in the case of Ontario actually show up as well in BC? Uh, but I do think that the second highest increase that we've recorded on a provincial basis is in BC at 18% or 18 plus percent. And I do think that's just a mix of the different factors that explain the strong interest in farmland in BC. Um, so I did say that I was going to be providing a little bit of an outlook. So it starts off with prices. And of course, you know, there's a lot of different crops that we grow and, and there are lots of different differences in the different markets that, that, that you see up on the screen. But I have four futures markets right now. So the one thing to note, you know, thinking about the results in 2021 is to, you know, focus on the shaded orange line there and see that this line for all the crops has been significantly, and in some cases for some crops, you know, think canola, for example, very significantly higher, if I can say that, uh, relative to previous years, as well as the five-year average and so on, right? So there's been is very tight inventories, very low stocks at the global level, very strong demand in 2021. The demand for vegetable oil, for example, is very, very robust there, um, for a number of different reasons, mandates with regards to biodiesel or renewable diesel in a lot of different countries in the US, for example, some challenges with regards to produce, production of palm oil and so forth in some Asian countries. There's a number of different factors that explain the tight marketplace, tight balance between, or the low balance between supply and demand right now. But overall prices were really strong in 2021. Now, if you focus on the green line, that would tell you, you know, where futures for the nearby contract are at right now, and prices are elevated. Of course, you know, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia really introduced quite a bit of volatility. If you look at the wheat market in the northeast quadrant of, of the slide, you can see this huge run up in wheat prices. Now we've seen a little bit of stability in the last couple of days here. But overall, you know, there's a lot of different fears in the market plate with respect to the ability of suppliers like Russia or like Ukraine to be able to deliver because Russia obviously is the number one a wheat exporter. Ukraine is a major wheat exporter, but it's also the fourth largest corn exporter in the world. So a lot of question marks whether or not, you know, the flows of commodities that we've seen in the past few years have been, will be able to be replicated this year, given the war in Ukraine. And so that has driven a lot of the prices up. But I will also point out, if you look at soybeans, for example, that some of the increases in prices have actually started to happen before the invasion of Russia or the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And so it's not just the conflict that are pushing up prices. It's also the fundamentals in the marketplace, this tight supply, tight inventories with risk relative to still a very strong demand. And I say still, because there is the possibility that we see this demand so often in the next few months there, a lot of this will depend on the evolution of the war because it could slow down the global economy and it could weaken demand. But overall, right now, demand's still very strong, supply is tight, and so prices are, are elevated. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to, to, to talk about prices. So if you combine the information we get from prices and apply that to some of the actual production volumes that we had and deliveries we made in 2021, that uh, brings the table that you see up on the screen. So there's a lot of information, a lot of numbers up on the screen. So let me walk you through that. So first of all, the 2021 receipts for grains, oil seeds, and pulses are an actual number. They're not an estimate or a forecast. We just got the final set of numbers recently, a couple of weeks back. So those are actual numbers. And you see a lot of green because the green illustrates that there's been a gain in gross income receipts, cash receipts for the different commodities, right? We see barley up 29.7% in 2021 relative to 2020. That's a pretty strong increase. But if you look at wheat, look at canola, despite, you know, the decline in the 2021 crop, you know, as I said, as much as 40% decline in production, clearly see that higher or stronger deliveries towards the end of the year, as well as much higher prices have actually off, offset some of the declines that we've seen in production. So the question now remains, you know, for 2022. And for 2022, what I decided to do is to actually come up with 
two options, right? There's a forecast a column label mid January, right? So that's the third column of numbers starting from the left hand side of the table. So those forecasts for cash receipts, I'm only reporting not to put too many numbers up on the screen. I'm only reporting the percent increase or decrease actually forecasted for 2022 relative to 2021. That forecast was computed and is available on our website. It was published in mid or towards late January, but it was computed in mid January. So prior to the conflict that we have right now between Ukraine and Russia. And now fast forward a few weeks later, uh, early March was the most recent forecast that we computed. And now the forecasts look entirely different, right? So if you look at the forecast at the beginning of the year, prior to the conflict, you look at canola, the forecast was for canola receipts to be fairly flat, right? A decline of 0.4%. That's roughly, you know, receipts remaining flat, which is actually a good thing because, you know, at uh, $12 billion worth of canola receipts in 2021, given that we have a smaller crop to market smaller 2021 crop to market, making some assumptions about what the 2022 crop is going to look like, so forth. I mean, to get a flat forecast for canola receipts, that's not a bad um, outcome. Same kind of story as well for wheat, right? 0.2% decline in wheat receipts. Um, but it's when you look at how the forecast now changed, given some of the pricing dynamics that we have in the marketplace. Now, given some of the prices that are for fall delivery are much lower than the prices that we have in the cash market right now for the nearby contracts, right? But having said that, you know, there are still still more, they're still higher for the fall delivery than they were prior to the conflict. The conflict only amplified some of the tightness in the marketplace that we have. And you look at some of the crops there, I mean, the change in the forecasts are absolutely um, very significant, right? If you look at corn, for example, 43.3%, that would be a major, major increase, right? More than $3.2 billion worth of receipts for corn. It, 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 it's just that Right now, we, you know, if, in terms of deciding what kind of numbers I'm going to rely on to make some forecasts and plan ahead for my business, let's say, I would say, and I need to say that I would use the mid-January numbers that more, they provide a more conservative estimate of what numbers, you know, are going to look like than the one on the right-hand side of the table. And using those more conservative numbers, actually, I think provide a more realistic scenario of what 2022 could look like because markets are so much volatile right now. And it's not to say that they can't go higher. They could, uh, for sure. What is going to take for the markets to actually give up some of the price increases that we've seen in recent weeks and months, it's going to really, it's, it's just going to lean first and foremost on the 2022 crop, right? So we'll have to wait and see what kind of crop we're expecting out of the United States. So we're going to need more information in terms of weather conditions, growing conditions and so forth. Because otherwise, you know, what are the different um, sources of supply that can alleviate some of the price pressure that we see in the marketplace? And, and really, frankly, it's really hard to find other stories, right? We some people have suggested that, well, China could release some of the large inventories for some crops that they have, but really there are a lot of question marks about the extent of the stocks that they do have in China. And on top of that, it's highly uncertain that they would consider releasing some of these stocks themselves. So I think, you know, the only scenario here is to, for prices to go back more towards a what their average has been, albeit at a, at a higher level than, than what the average has been, but for prices to give up some of the gains that we've seen in the marketplace recently um, is for actually a large, large 2022 crop. And, and obviously at this point in time, there's just no way to know for sure. Of course, you know, a, 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 the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is going to go a long way also in sort of bringing prices more in line towards what they were uh, at the level of their, they were at at the beginning of the year. But again, there, nobody exactly knows how this, this war is going to end. And so there's a lot of volatility, expect a lot of volatility in 2022. But if I were to use a set of numbers to understand how revenues on my farm could actually fluctuate, you know, in the next year, I would use the mid-January forecast. There's just too much uncertainty right now with regards to some of the pricing and the marketplace to lean on the, on the, um, on the March forecast. Having said that, that does illustrate some of the upside in the marketplace. 
And when we think of upside from a revenue standpoint, I do think that to me, it suggests that demand is going to remain very strong for farmland in the coming year. So that's, you know, number one is, you know, crop receipts or receipts of grains and oil season pulses that are driving a lot of the demand in the marketplace. Now, the second thing that we need to be thinking about for 2021 and 22 is really uh, interest rates. We already have had one rate increase from the Bank of Canada and that policy rate in early March. We're expecting, we're working at FCC with the assumption that we're going to get at least four other rate increases from the Bank of Canada. So that would take, you know, the Bank of Canada rate from 0.25% to 1.5% by the end of 2022. There are other forecasts that call for one more additional, one additional increase on top of the assumption that we're using. So just full disclosure, we're probably on the low end of the, the forecast for rate increases from the Bank of Canada. But the one point I want to make with this particular chart, this is the business average borrowing cost as reported by the Bank of Canada. So it's not just for ag and, 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 and food, it's, it's for the entire economy. That's what the average business borrowing rate for all businesses across all sectors in Canada is, right? So it, it considers short-term lending, long-term lending, variable rates, fixed rates, and so forth. So put everything in the same basket, come up with an average. And so that's what the Bank of Canada has put together. I like to track that number because it just shows to me a very important, significant point. Well, two points. One is that when we were in the winter of 2021, uh, early 2021, we had the lowest borrowing cost on record in Canada. So when I said that, you know, low interest rates support the demand for farmland, that's what I meant. Uh, rates were really, really low. They're still low from an historical standpoint, but they were very, very low for the first six months of 2021. And I did support the demand for land because it makes it easier to afford land uh, at um, current prices. The second point I want to make, which I think is really important to think about when we plan for 2022, is that interest rates started to climb in Canada way before early March 2022. Actually, just early fall of 2021, perhaps in September, we've seen interest rates climb in Canada, which basically is a result of financial markets anticipating that yet the bank, yes, the Bank of Canada is, is going to have to lift its policy rate to fight off inflation that is very strong right now. And the markets are always at least one step ahead of the bank, right? So it's all a matter of expectations. And so by with markets expecting that the Bank of Canada is going to have to lift interest rates, well, we've seen, you know, interest rates for bonds, whether it's government bonds or business or corporations, We've seen those interest rates starting to climb, you know, in the fall of 2021. Now, the increase, you know, if you focus on the far right of this chart, the increase has not been that spectacular. You're talking about maybe, you know, 50 basis points or so. Um, so it's still very manageable, I would say, from an historical standpoint. Rates on average are still very low if you fo focus on the far right of the chart. But I think what the market is looking at is say, all right, we've already seen the long-term interest rate. So if you think of a five-year um, fixed rate for a mortgage, that rate right now is slightly above where it was prior to the pandemic. Like, so those rates have already caught on to where they were prior to the pandemic, even if the Bank of Canada itself is still in the process of lifting its policy rate. So as I said, the markets, financial markets, when it comes to interest rates are a step ahead of what the bank, where the Bank of Canada is. And I do think that when it comes to planning in 2022, I think we have to think about, all right, so the markets are probably gonna wait and see if the four increases that I was talking about from the Bank of Canada, in their policy rate, if those four increases are enough to slow down, weaken the trend in inflation, then perhaps markets will be happy and they're not gonna push up the long-term rates even more. So what you're seeing right now in terms of long-term rates, think of a five-year mortgage, a 10-year mortgage, they're probably as high as you're likely to see in the foreseeable future. So that's one possibility. But inflation, if inflation persists and it's really, it becomes really hard for the bank you know, to, to, to bring down inflation and it requires more 
even if it's not in the near term, because there's a lot of uncertainty with regards to the state of the global economy with the war. But even if it's not in the near term, if the mar markets believe that that's going to require more than four other increases in the policy rate, well, they could actually push long-term rates um, a little bit higher than where they are now. And so I think that's what I mean by, you know, trying to think a plan for 2022. I think businesses need to evaluate what kind of financial risk they're exposed to. Uh, where do they stand in terms of their loan portfolio, whether or not, you know, they are mostly short-term, long-term fixed variable and so forth, and evaluate what type of risk they face given what we've discussed in terms of income trends, as well as given like some of the possible trends in interest rates, because interest rates are going to climb. They've already started to climb. Uh, and it's just a matter, you know, the question is really where to. I do think given, given all the issues in the world economy right now, given some of the issues that Europe is likely to face with regards to their source of supply of energy and so forth. It's going to be, I do think at some point in time, the, the inflation trend is going to slow based on some of the weaker demand we're likely to see because of the world economy weakening a little bit because of the, the war right now that we have. Um, so maybe I, I'm fairly confident that the four increases from the Bank of Canada that I was speaking about at the at the beginning of this particular slide, I do think that that's likely to be enough. But this is, again, I mean, there's, there is the possibility that it's not enough to fight off inflation trends that we have in the marketplace right now. And so I would plan or I would evaluate at the very least, I would evaluate what kind of risk, financial risk I am exposed to, especially if I bought land recently and made some, some, some investments and took out some loans. So that's that's in essence what I had for this presentation. I'm I'm hopeful that because I'm not seeing the the Q for uh, the Q and A, but I'm hopeful I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. I think in 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 the conclusion I would say that you know I do think that some of the higher or the high increases that we've seen for farmland values are reflective of, of the optimism in the industry and the positive outlook that we have in the industry. I think it's a matter of for farms to evaluate their risk, you know, whether from a marketing standpoint, production standpoint, and financial standpoint. But I do think that it reflects some of the positive outlook that we have for income. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Kevin, see if we yep. have any questions in the queue and uh, let's yes. have a little bit of a discussion. We do have questions and there's a lot to discuss here. I, I'm sure from a historical standpoint, some of the reports that you've done in the past haven't had anywhere near as much, so many factors involved in, in making this forecast. So I can imagine that was fairly uh, challenging. The last, the last little bit you were talking about there, JP, was the whole idea of the Bank of Canada moving four, maybe five times this year uh, to, to try to put a, a lid on inflation. Uh, is, is, is it your guess? I mean, I get you painted a picture. You've got some bullishness on the commodity side, but you've also got increases in interest rates. Do you think that those potential increases will cool farmland values enough or will it just keep going? What's your guess? I think, well, I've said this in the past. And so I still believe it. I do. I do think if I were to rank the drivers of farmland values, I'm going to rank farm income number one. I'm going to rank interest rates number two. So to, to that extent, I do think that interest rates are not going to be as important of a driver as farm income trends. And right now, farm income trends are very positive, right? It would be yeah. awesome if we could somewhat split the rate of increase that we are reporting and say, well, you know, half of it is a result of low interest rates and half of it is a result of income trends that we have in the marketplace right now. But the fact of the matter, that's, that's nearly impossible to do. So... Uh, but I, I think, you know, from a past correlations, I do think that farm income is more important than, than interest rates. So yes, to your question, to some extent, I don't think that if we only, and only is, is, is not exactly the right word, but if we have those four additional increases, I do think that this is not going to slow the farmland market as much as, you know, if we had more increases and I, I think those four can be absorbed. It's going to have an impact, but not as yeah. big as, as uh, you know, perhaps a decline in farm income or something else that could happen that, that would have more of an impact coming from an income side of, of the equation. As I was listening to your presentation and, you know, you talked about things about, you know, it's important to look at a couple of years of data and such. And, and also there's some questions coming in related to this. And so what I'm talking about is this idea of the bubble. And so, uh, for example, there's one question here, given the large increase in farmland values in Ontario and the relatively flat crop receipts, 
uh, any concerns that the increase could be evidence that this is a bubble. So we have to acknowledge that land is not only at the most expensive point of, of history when it comes to dollar per acre, but it's also in terms of the valuations that buyers and sellers assigned to the asset is also yeah. at the highest point in time. So what I mean by that is not only in dollar per acre, but if you look at the price of land relative to the value of productive value of land, and you put the two together, we're at some of the highest point, depending on the province, depending on the region, you know, you have also to account that, you know, in, in some provinces, there are some significant weather challenges. And so it's a, a year off and, and, you know, but if you look at the trend, for I would say the majority of different regions in Canada, we're at the point of land is at the most expensive point, not only in a dollar per acre sense, but also in terms of relative to the productive value of land. And so I think, you know, to answer the question, I would just point that out and say, hey, we have to acknowledge that. We have to understand that as an industry, this is where we're at. And so perhaps, you know, um, buying land makes sense if it fits the strategic objectives of your operation, which is, you know, whether an expansion, capturing economies of scale, diversification, whatever the mm -hmm. strategic goal is behind this, it, it, I'm not saying that because it's a high price, it's not going to make sense. I mean, it does make sense and building equity within the farm operation has been a successful proven strategy over the years. But yeah, I think we do need to acknowledge that we're at some of the highest price point over time. Now, this may not be a fair question because you may have to go through data to do this, but in the past when we've seen, whether you call it a bubble, but at least a, a spike in farmland values, is there, is there ever that you're aware of a trend of what typically happens after a, a fast uh, ascension in valuations or, or is there not really a trend there? Well, we, we don't have that phenomena in Canada, we've had mm. this phenomenon in the US, right? If you look at 2012 to 2014, and then we had a couple of years in the US Midwest where, you know, there were some really large increases, larger than what we had in Canada, which I believe explains a little bit as to why the market actually made it 180 and then had a couple of years of decline to stabilize at, its, at some level. The market's a much I would say more fluid in the U S or it responds a little bit more the, the magnitude of the increases have been a little bit higher in the U S over time. So which actually triggered a little bit of a decline in the U S. So in Canada, that is, you know, you have to go back to the, the, the eighties really where we had some significant land declines in land values to, to, um, to, to, to notice such a phenomena, but the, the, rate of increase is in Canada as mirrored those in the U S but as the magnitude of that has not been to the extent of the U S which I think explains why we've never had this a little bit of a downturn at the mid 2010 or, you know, in those last decade or previous decade, so that, um, it, you know, we've had those declines, but this is not to say that we're immune to that. I mean, obviously in some of the marketplaces where we've had the largest rate of increases, perhaps that exposes, that increases the likelihood at some point in time to see a little bit of a decline. I do think that the outlook's positive. I do think that valuations assigned to the asset are absolutely at the highest point, but that doesn't mean that this is going to be um, lasting for a, a long period of time as well, right? So I think good risk management is necessary here in this case. I'm going to make the assumption wrongly so, and you can clarify. I'm assuming you're talking about with farmland values, you're talking about... Uh, uh, cropping land uh, does how do these numbers you provide relate to pasture land for example yeah they apply to crop land and and that's documented in the report what we uh, consider part of the sample so if you know for for different people interested in the different dynamics within the province and the different the mix of different farming activities they'll find the information in the report but yes it, it does it, it's it applies to you know cultivated land yes Okay. Um, there's a question here. Do you see if at all uh, in terms of a correlation between farmland value and farm income? And I know you've touched on that, but is, are you seeing that correlation? Yes, absolutely. And there is a correlation. It's just that in the last few years, you know, we've had in some areas, I mean, Ontario would be one of them where the rate of increase in land values has exceeded the rate of increase in farm income. 
interestingly as well, you know, in the prairies, I mean, that's been a very, very strong correlation. And we haven't had this, this higher rate of increase for land relative to the rate of increase in income, but we're still, wherever we are in the country, we're still, as I said, you know, at, at some of the points, you know, in time where we have the highest valuation for land relative to the income you can gross off that land. So yeah. that makes land very expensive right now, not just in absolute terms, you know, in a dollar per acre basis, but as well as, as relative to what you can gross off the land. So um, it's, it's, it's that correlation is there for sure. Um, it's just that in recent years, I do think that this rate of increase is, um, you know, in, in land values has exceeded the rate of increase in, in income. Having said that, with some of the strong, very robust and elevated forecasts that we have for trends in farm income, who knows how this is going to look like in, in 2022. Mm -hmm. You've obviously talked a lot about the typical drivers of farmland, and, and there are a handful of them. A couple of questions about that. One is, what, a, what impact would ag investment be having right now on, on farmland? Yeah, there, there's um, a diversity of buyers, but I would say that the vast majority of transactions, and they're not just transactions that FCC is involved with in terms of lending money, but it's, those are transactions that we collect uh, uh, as part of our normal business to understand the trends in the market for, for farmland and so forth. Um, I'd say the vast, vast majority of farmland is sold and bought by operations and farm operations in general. So it's, there's a presence from an invest from investment firms for sure. Uh, sometimes it, it doesn't have that this, this investment firm doesn't have to be buying land to actually have an impact, but that impact is, localized so to speak to some specific areas i would say by and large the results year over year uh, or year after year that we present are driven by farm operations buying from other farm operations someone here has asked with regard to you mentioned the bank of canada possibly moving four or five times this year they're asking uh, what might you see those four or so increases getting to what number well, if you, if you look, you start off from the Bank of Canada rate, the, pol the overnight rate, which is their policy rate, you know, roughly it was, not roughly, it was at 25.25% uh, prior to this last increase. So currently it sits at 0.5%. So that, you know, increase from 0.25 to 0.50, uh, that 25 basis point increase triggers an, a proportional increase in prime rate. And then if you are a business that are, borrowing and has some loans priced under a variable rate well that variable rate will likely be off a prime rate so if prime rate goes up your variable rate goes up what is really difficult to anticipate and project into the future is the impact on those long-term fixed rates right if you think of a five-year mortgage a 10-year mortgage because those rates are set by the marketplace yes they are influenced by what the bank of canada does and say but at the end of the day, it really is set by the marketplace. So if you think of a financial institutions and the rate that it offers to those that are borrowing money, well, the financial institution like FCC or any other financial institution really would actually borrow money from the marketplace, then turn it, turn over and then, you know, lend it back to customers. And so uh, if those borrowing funds or those funds are actually moving up in terms of prices, in terms of the rates moving up in the marketplace, that means that borrowers will be faced with some higher rates as well. And they're not, they're not necessarily in line or proportional to what the Bank of Canada does. As I pointed out, you know, some of the long-term rates that we have right now have been moving up before the Bank of Canada doing anything really. And so I think it's, 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 I think a point, a critical point to understand for businesses that are looking to say, well, I'm going to wait till, you know, to see what actually goes on with the Bank of Canada rate, given there's so much uncertainty right now in the world, whether or not they're going to try to wait a little bit and, and, and not raise their policy rate as fast. I'm just going to wait to see if uh, I can wait a little bit before locking in some long-term rates and so forth. Well, I, that's perfectly fine to do so as long as you realize that you know markets even if the bank of canada does nothing that the markets can actually bring those those long-term rates up while you wait and so it's 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 really just evaluating the risk trade-off right now of locking in some rates before uh the bank of canada continues to to tighten the, the monetary policy in canada 
There's a question that's come in here that's asking about the potential impact of, of a change in tax rate, a taxation. For example, they use the example of a change in capital gains, say a jump from 50% to 75%. Might that cause ag uh, land in, investors to sell holdings and such? It, it could, it could. So because I mean, fiscal planning is a big part of the decisions that are made on the farm. It could, I mean, it's really hard to predict given that we have so little to actually lean on when it comes to forecasting because forecasts are really based off using some historical data. So this is not something that really I can speak to. It could, uh, it has the potential to do so given that, as I said, fiscal planning is a big part of management on the farm. But um, I, I, I just don't know that... Uh, it's it's something that we can forecast right now in terms of potential impacts. Right. Now, here's a question. I'm not sure if it's related to what's going on in the Ukraine. It's just, just sug suggesting a, a bit of a blue sky thought. Uh, what would happen potentially if sanctions on China uh, further complicate ag exports? I I, th I do think that it's 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 really a two the two sides to this uh, story here. There's one side that says, hey, you know, if we have more sanctions in terms of, and then we're um, for some reason try to uh, restrain the ability of China to source what they need from the world markets and so forth, perhaps, you know, that would actually subside, you know, put some, alleviate some of the price pressures given that the strength of demand would actually be um, a little bit uh, less than what it is right now. And, and we're starting to see some of that actually right now. I mean, there's a major area in China that is under lockdown as they still have their zero COVID policy. And so they're locking down some areas um, that, and, and that lockdown is going to actually have an impact on the global economy, I believe. So uh, that's a pretty good example of some of the potential demand destruction that uh, you, you can read about sometimes when we talk about inflation, right? The two ways to solve inflation really, right? One is to augment, increase productive capacity of the economy. And we're starting to see some of that in the US, there's a lot more business investment in Canada to some extent. So we're, we're starting to see more of that. And actually it's the ideal scenario, right? So the idea of fighting off inflation, not with tightening monetary policy and lifting rates and slowing down demand, but if we can lift you know, the productive capacity of the economy so that it catches up with the very strong demand that we have as supply catches up with the very strong demand that we have, that'd be a good thing. So, you know, when it comes to sanctions on China, if it does lead to demand destruction, I do think that, you know, from a commodity standpoint, we could actually see China trying to exercise leverage some of the stocks that they hold, not knowing exactly the extent of these stocks. I mean, we have a vague idea in terms of the data being available, but no one knows for sure. Um, and I do think that it could alleviate some of the high prices that we have right now in the marketplace. Any thoughts to share on um, the correlation really of input costs and their effect on debt serviceability going forward? Yeah, I think it's a very fair point because this is not something that I've actually talked about during the presentation. And I do think that's, a, that's actually quite important. Um, if you look at input costs, that no doubt everything's going up and that's going to remain elevated for a while. I mean, we were just did a little bit of a calculation on the side of the desk for now, but looking at some you know fuel costs on the farm and, and that can represent the movement that we've seen in fuel for in the last few weeks can represent as much as $20 on an acre, uh, even more so, you know, for some farms that are using more fuel and so forth. So uh, it is uh, significant. Um, don't want to downplay that rising input costs are putting um, a challenge on profitability for sure. It's just that I'm focusing on gross income for a reason. And the main reason is that historically correlation between gross income and land values is a lot stronger than what uh, correlation is between net income and land values. Now, this is not to say that it's not important, right? Because from a credit standpoint or financial planning standpoint, the ability to service debt is actually function of net income. So from an aggregate market perspective, I rather lean on gross income simply because I do think that the correlation is stronger to understand and speak of what is expected to happen in the marketplace or what has happened in the marketplace. But when it comes to actually within the operation, looking at uh, ideas for investment, plans for development, expansion, so forth, and investment overall, I really do think that the servicing, uh, the idea of debt servicing capacity when it comes to investment is, is really related to that income. And in that sense, the prices, inflation that we have on farm inputs are going to be uh, putting a little bit of a challenge and could actually 
slow down to some extent some of the, the demand for farmland that, uh, that we've seen last year. So this question comes in is related to the answer you just gave, touching on the idea of, of, you know, as you mentioned, increases in commodity prices have a positive effect on farm income, but of course, increases in input costs as well. So I assume you took into uh, consideration those factors when you put in your forecasts? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we okay. need to, to account for the full picture. As I said, though, I always like to fork, well, not always, not, like is not the right word, but always think that it's actually more relevant when we think of market trends to use gross income, simply because it's just, you know, historically the connection to land values is a lot stronger when you think of gross income than net income. But uh, absolutely from a, a business standpoint, business planning standpoint and farm management standpoint, I do think that that's absolutely relevant to consider your costs, obviously. And I know this is a very hard question, but we're looking at an economy right now where you could argue with a touch of inflation happening, with supply chains have been disrupted, that you could almost generalize and say everything has gotten expensive, including uh, farmland. So I guess a two-part question, um, and maybe this isn't that easy, but should I consider buying land this year based on we've talked about the bubble and some other factors? And second of all, if I do take on debt this year with the you talked about, you know, maybe four, maybe five increases uh, from the Bank of Canada. Are there any things I need to be really aware of and consider if I take on extra debt this year? Well, in, in, in the case of taking on extra debt, I do think that what is um, wise, I would say, to evaluate is the risk that you face if you're going with short-term rates and short-term loans. Um, I do think if you're able to lock in the rates and have this capacity to to project into the future what your debt servicing load is going to look like with the, more, the money that you borrow. I do think that's, that's actually good risk management given the uncertainty that we have in the marketplace right now, right? With inflation being so high, it might mean that, you know, four increases in the Bank of Canada rate are not enough. And that's when it would, mm. it would trigger, in my opinion, some, some fairly significant movement in interest rates overall. So I think it, it'd be good risk management to consider the, the possibility of locking in rates if you're taking on an additional loan. And in terms of buying land, I do think, as I said, I, as long as it matches up with the strategic, um, strategic plan of the business, where you want to take your business or what, if, what, is, what are the strategic goals in terms of buying land. And as long as you acknowledge that, you know, land is at the most expensive point or price point in time, I think that's, that's, that's a, it's a good business decision then. As long as those two things are recognized that, hey, it meet, fits the strategic goals of my business and I'm buying probably at the highest point in terms of the valuation of that asset, um, and, and with the fact that nobody knows exactly how this valuation is going to evolve over time. But I do think that it, it makes sense for businesses that are looking to grow, capture economies of scale, diversify, or, or whatever else strategic goal there is in the business. What is your expectation for the Canadian dollar relative to the U.S. dollar in 22? Well, this is, this is just a really hard question right now, simply because any type of models doesn't work really in the current situation, given that there's a flight to safety towards the U.S. dollar. We should have a much higher loony right now than it is, simply because right now there's a lot of, of demand for U.S. dollars, given as well. It's just the fact that anytime we have a high level of uncertainty in the marketplace, then investors are flying to the safety of the U.S., the perceived safety of the U.S. dollar. And so that makes the U.S. dollar go up and that leads to a decline relative to the U.S. dollar of pretty much every currency, right? So we're no different given the really high oil prices right now. Um, I, I think that's really right now the flight to safety that drives everything. And that's going to drive everything until we have a little bit more clarity as how the situation is going to evolve. But as long as we don't have clarity in terms of the extent of the sanctions, the extent of whether those sanctions are going to actually involve some of the supply of energy coming from Russia and put the European Union in a really tough spot, you know, from basically sourcing the energy needs that they have, uh, I think, you know, we're still going to see a strong, strong U.S. dollar, and that's going to keep our, our Canadian dollar lower than what it would be normally. Now, having said that, if, if we are able to see this uncertainty dissolve and, and have a little bit more clarity as how the situation is going to unfold later in 2022 or in the next few weeks or months, who knows, 
then maybe I think I would see our Canadian dollar go up. But right now, I think this is entirely, entirely driven. And that's going to remain the, entirely driven by the flight to safety. And I, I do think that's going to remain the case for yeah. the foreseeable future. We're getting close to the top of the hour here. So maybe I can squeeze in two more questions here. Uh, let's put your farmer boots on for a moment. You're, you're the farmer. And are you inclined right now to lock in for the long term? Yes. I'm very talking simple interest answer. rates. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I am. Absolutely. Like five yeah. years, 10 years, 15? Like yeah, well, we have more and more, uh, more and more businesses that are looking at locking in for 10 years. I mean, it's that peace of mind and knowing where their payments are going to be like, you know, and given that, you know, they can focus on other things within their business in terms of, you know, seeking efficiencies elsewhere from a production standpoint. I would be tempted given that, you know, again, I, the chart that I put up on the screen uh, when it comes to interest rates actually had a five-year horizon, I believe. And that's actually a very short period of time. And I know that the argument when I say I respond yes, like I did to the question you asked, Kevin, I know that the argument has been, well, historically I've been coming on top um, when you know going the short-term route, right? Looking at one-year term and so forth and renewing and, and over and over and over again, as opposed to locking in for five years. And I get that, absolutely. You know, in an environment where really interest rates have been on a long-term declining trend since 1995, really, uh, yes, absolutely. The answer has been yes, you will go short-term and that actually has been most likely profitable depending on the timing of decisions you made in your business. But if you're looking at, you know, coming off the lowest borrowing cost on record historically in early 2021, coming off a world pandemic, putting aside the conflict right now, the war, um, and given it where inflation it is, I do think it buys peace of mind, frankly. Final question, and, I'm, and unfortunately, I don't think this is a short answer question, but it's an important one nonetheless. Uh, this question comes in from somebody in BC asking you to maybe speak a little bit more to the increases in land values in BC, uh, despite the flooding. You'd mentioned that a lot of the you know, changes in the West were weather related, but despite that, uh, what is your take on farm land value outside of that? You know, a very good question, because I, 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 I did plan on speaking to that, and I, I kind of slipped. Um, slipped over it uh, in, in my notes yeah. here. Um, yeah, it's the, the flooding in BC, uh, the drought in prairies and, and all those extreme weather events. Um, it's not to say that they won't have an impact in 2022, right? So most of the transactions I think were post flooding, uh, sorry, pre flooding. And um, I, I, do, I do think that I don't expect it. I don't expect the impact to be that significant but I'm not going to rule out the possibility of seeing a much slower rate of increase in, in 2022 um, or a flat market in BC. And the reason is, you know, if uh, that I'm expecting not, you know, that uh, that's, it's, it's not going to have that much of an impact, but it's possible to see one is looking back at some of the more, most extreme weather events that we've had in the past, whether, you know, in the prairies in BC and so forth. And, and usually what we did is, and it's actually available on the website and analysis. Um, what we noticed is that, yeah, you know, following the years of an extreme weather event, we've had slower rate of increases that normally we would have expected slower, but not that significant of a slowdown. So there's a little bit of an effect, but it doesn't seem to be that material. So um, if I put aside the fact that BC was very strong at, I have to look at my notes, there's so many numbers, 18% this year. Um, putting aside the fact that it was really, really strong at that level, I don't expect the flooding to have a significant impact, but I would expect this rate of increase in BC to normalize towards more what it was the years past, right? In 2020, we had... 8% increase in average farmland values in BC. And the year prior to that, in 2019, we had 5.4%. So in summary, not too much of an impact, but I, I don't rule it out really that we're going to have a slower rate of increase in BC for sure in, in the last nice. few years. Well, JP, we'll have to leave it there because we've run out of time. But do appreciate your insights. Always insightful, always timely. Look forward to uh, some of your information that will be coming out again uh, next month. And, and on that topic, I guess I would just remind some of the people that are watching of, of a couple of reminders related to what you've heard today. First of all, um, 
you know, JP has gone through a lot of important information in a really short time. And this is why uh, the fact that this session has been recorded is really important so that you can go back through and uh, listen to it again or share it with family and friends if uh, you want to. Second thing, FCC is going to email you a link to the farmland values report. And so that link will arrive, you know, in, in a day or two. The third thing is that FCC customers that have an online services account have actually access to more frequently updated uh, farmland values information in your area. So if you'd like to know more about accessing online services, just, uh, just touch base with the customer service folks at FCC or contact your local FCC office. Uh, as well, if you, uh, we had a, a question about pasture land, there's also be some questions about farmland rental rates. And so if you are interested in that topic, JP is going to have more analysis in the month of April on farmland rental rates and uh, FCC will follow up with you with an email. Uh, the final link that you're going to receive is an evaluation form. And if you get a moment to provide some feedback on these events, what you'd like to see more of and that sort of thing, it is always appreciated. And with that, I will bid you all adieu. And uh, on behalf of FCC, thanks for loaning us some of your valuable time and make it a great day.